Okay, we want to talk now about the dangers in the mobile world. And to do that, I'm happy to welcome on the stage for a one-on-one -on -one conversation, the CEO of Avis, Mr. Vince Steckler. Vince, come on out. Welcome Thank you. Good stage. morning. Come on, let's take a seat. So, you know, today is the day to talk about um, security, safety, also cyber crime, and we, we want to talk about the risks in the mobile world right now. What are the biggest risks right now? Well, there's really only two risks in the, uh, in the mobile world for both consumers and for corporations. And those two risks are, are the mobile device itself uh, and the user of the mobile device. Um, you know, you know, one of things we gotta you know, you know, recognize about mobiles is the mobile knows no difference about what it's being used for. Is it being used for corporate or is it being used for personal? Most everything these days is a blend of either BYOD, where the user is using their personal device for business, or frankly, they're using their business device for personal usage. And everything gets intermixed. And we got to realize that how Android and iOS are, they're very, very primitive operating systems. There's virtually no security in them or protection in them to, uh, to protect, uh, for example, if you give access, uh, if an app needs access to photos or directory, it has complete access. There's no such thing as just read access, you know, no change rights, et cetera. So the device is wide open, and when you blend it, 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 it just creates something uh, really phenomenal, uh, phenomenally uh, difficult to protect. Can we do a flash poll for you right now? Just to ask people if, if they, you know, if they have their, if they're part of a BYOD business yeah. right now. I mean, how many people here bring your own device to work? How many? So that's what about 50, 50 percent, right? And does that mean that the rest of you use your business device for personal also? Yeah. Okay. How many people use WhatsApp for personal usage? Oh, okay. Wow. And how many of, of you have your company given permission to share your corporate directory with WhatsApp? Because when you use WhatsApp, it uploads your entire phone directory, which is probably primarily your business contacts. How many of your businesses have uh, given permission to do that? But does WhatsApp ask you for permission to do that? Yes, but you cannot use WhatsApp without agreeing to do it. It's so a trade-off. Okay, so that's part of the agreement we were talking about earlier this week. No one ever reads that agreement, though, do they? Uh, well, I mean, it pops up a question. It's, it, it's very obvious, uh, you know, asking you to grant permission for WhatsApp to access your contacts. Yeah. If, it's, uh, if you say yes, it uh, uploads everything to WhatsApp. Now, WhatsApp's a trusted company. They're owned by Facebook. They're not going to go off and try to hack all your friends, etc. Um, but if you say no, then you can't use WhatsApp. Right. It's binary. Same thing with most every apps. Uh, if they want a permission, uh, that's the exchange. What about if we're transferring data over Wi-Fi? Well, transferring data over Wi-Fi is, kind of, um, is kind of cool because how many um, people here um, let your phone automatically connect to known Wi-Fi's, such as Starbucks, or here at CBIT, the CBIT Wi-Fi? Now, now that I don't believe. I mean, almost everyone allows their phone to automatically connect. We did a, we did a launch event um, in uh, California a little over a year ago. We had 18 journalists. And we set up a fake ATT Wi-Fi. ATT Wi-Fi is what in the US is Starbucks. And of those 18 journalists, 16 phones automatically connected to our fake ATT Wi-Fi. Uh -huh. One person actually started doing banking on our fake ATT Wi-Fi. Oh my gosh. We were actually going to set one up here, but the equipment didn't arrive in time. Um, but we did it last month at, at uh, Mobile World, uh, at the Barcelona airport basically at the check-in desk for Mobile World. And in a matter of a few hours, we had 2,000 people connect to our fake Wi-Fi's, which just used a made-up name, you know, free Barcelona Wi-Fi. You know, people see it, they connect to it. And, um, you know, over 60% started doing their email, which was on Google. Um, about half started using Facebook. So, I mean, companies, uh, you know, that's 
stuff, uh, some of that stuff's company related. Um, about half were on iPhones, about 43% were on Androids, which shows that the, uh, the uh, mobile people are very skewed towards iOS. But it also shows that we're a very boring audience. Uh, only 1% of all the people were uh, actually you were using dating applications on the mobile. So only 1%, 1%. were using Tinder or other dating apps to find someone in Barcelona. Uh -huh. So if you're an employer and you sent staff to Barcelona, rest assured that 99% of them were focused on work and not on finding a date. That's kind of depressing, isn't it? It's the tech audience. It's a tech audience, yeah. I mean, we, don't, we, don't, we, we, don't, we don't want to push any stereotypes here about tech people, but yeah, wow, that's surprising. You know, we had talked earlier, um, you had mentioned the, the risk of employees losing their phones and, and about them selling their phones with sensitive business data um, on them. If, if I lose my phone and use a pen, isn't the access restricted um, to third purse? parties. And second, you mentioned that the factory reset sometimes does not work. So tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, it's, a, it's a complicated environment on a lost phone or as you've read recently in the U.S. with the FBI's attempts to get access to, uh, to Apple, Apple phones. Yeah. Um, in that essentially if you're using an older Android phone, say before 4.4, um, encryption and, and security were almost non-existent. And they essentially um, deleted files as Windows has historically deleted files. That is, instead of deleting the whole file and overwriting the space, they just essentially changed the first character of the file name to indicate to Android that it was deleted, but all the data was still there. And factory resets on older Androids also didn't actually delete any data. So we've done many studies where we go off and buy used phones, either from eBay or from pawn shops, most of which have been factory reset, most, many of which actually have a, quote, security product on them. Um, and we can recover massive amounts of data. Uh, it's all there. Apple phones are a little more difficult, and frankly, much more difficult, because they are all encrypted. And when you factory reset an Apple phone, it deletes the encryption key. Um, and then you're dead. And of course, it's the recovery of that encryption key that the FBI wants from uh, Apple right now. But strangely enough, the addition of fingerprint sensors really weakens the security of phones. Why is that? Um, because you leave your fingerprint on the phone, and the fingerprint is very easy to lift. Mm -hmm. And you can do it as the, um, as the Americans do it, uh, one of the universities last week, to just lift the fingerprints print out the fingerprint in a, in a heavy ink and then press that paper against the sensor and it's open. Or you can do it as the Germans do it, which is a much more elegant solution, which is lift the fingerprint and make a whole 3D thumb rather than just print it out on paper. Right. <laughs> and use that 3D thumb and uh, you know, open the phone. So fingerprint sensors right now are just very easily hacked. I mean, they're, they're very, very convenient, but they're easy to get around. Let me, you know, while you're on stage, let me ask you about the Apple FBI conflict, if you will. Uh, we've, been, we've been talking about that all week, and some people have been asking, um, don't you believe that the FBI has already taken that phone and that they've, they've already you know, been able to get access to it? And, if that's the case, then what are we seeing? Is this a, is this a charade for the public? Apple trying to defend the, the rights uh, of privacy of its customers? I mean, what's your take on the, what we're seeing? Well, I don't really, you know, I, I've got no firsthand knowledge of it, but I don't think the FBI has cracked uh, you don't that think phone. so? I, no. uh, I don't think they have, because it, it came out publicly that they had screwed up their chance of doing it, right. which was when they changed the password. Yes. If they hadn't changed the password, they would have had everything, but they were kind of stupid and changed the password. Um, <laughs> so can they crack it? Uh, I, I think most people bet that if the phone was handed over to the NSA, that the yeah. NSA could crack it. But that may mean, you know, using what an ion gun or whatever to read uh, to read it at the chip level, yeah. as opposed to kind of the more elegant that the FBI wants, which is Apple give us some code to to uh, get around the password. Um, but is it a bit of a charade, a test case? Yeah. Uh, absolutely, because yeah, you know, it's it's one where 
you, know, you would expect the vast majority of the American public because it's, quote, counterterrorism. These yeah. were bad people. They killed a lot of innocent folks. Apple, you know, the FBI is trying to do the good thing, get access to the phone, see who else was in on the conspiracy. I mean, who, you know, who can argue with that? So I think they purposefully chose that in order to uh, demonstrate a case here. And I think Apple's point is, it's not up to the judicial to decide what the law is. If the legislature and the executive branch think there should be a law, they can pass the law. But they have decided that there should not to be such a law, and the judicial should not go around the legislature by uh, trying to cite, what, a 225-year-old law uh, that they claim gives right. them access. That's but true. it's going to be interesting. You, you also mentioned, Vince, that um, employees install uh, personal apps on their business devices. What's at risk there when they do that? Well, the phone is blended. So um, the phone has no idea what on the phone is personal, what is corporate, and the app has, has no idea. So, you know, I mean, even the simple things you said about, you know, uh, corporate, uh, phone directories or emails, apps have access to so many things on your phone. Uh, even uh, innocuous apps. Um, like if anyone has an Android phone, install an alarm clock or a calculator and see everything that it asks for permission uh, to have. Right. And you'd be surprised how many things an alarm clock needs. I had never known that an alarm clock to work needs access to my phone directory and my pictures. Yeah, but why is that? <laughs> Because lots of these apps are fundamentally in the, dis in the businesses of acquiring data uh -huh. to make money from. Yeah. Now, that's not true of the big guys, but it, you know, if you get these smaller things, that's what they're doing. Uh, and you got to realize that, you know, face it, you know, if you use the calculator that comes with iOS, it's garbage. So everyone wants to put a calculator on, yeah. but you got to be really careful on these basic things. And, you know, lots of these things can be designed to just um, steal information. So what would you recommend then? What can businesses do to secure their, their sensitive data on mobile devices? I mean, it's a, it's a very complicated thing because, you know, uh, the phone, it's not schizophrenic. You can't divide that phone into do only this for business, do only this for personal, and we all got to recognize we use a phone for both. So what we advocate these days um, is to essentially use the local capability of the phone only for personal usage and virtualize everything else. That is, with, with, with technology these days for a, um, especially a large company, uh, they can actually virtualize all of the apps and run it on their corporate servers and just use the phone as essentially an I.O. device, mm -hmm. but it's always attached to the company's servers. You know, very much like a um, you know, virtualization at the desktop level, but virtualization on the phone. Uh, the technologies these days actually work uh, quite well for it. Obviously, I wouldn't be pitching it if we didn't have such a technology also, but that's the only way of getting that total separation between the corporate usage of a device and the personal usage and making sure that there's no bleeding in between, making sure that if you lose the device, uh, you haven't lost any data. And some people think like cloud is, is the magical solution, that if everything's in the cloud, uh, then there's nothing on the device and it doesn't matter. The problem is for pretty much all the cloud services, your logon credentials are on the device. For example, if you use uh, Google Mail, yeah. Um, uh, Google Mail's logon credentials are usually on the device with an expiry of 90 days. Uh, so if you lose the device, uh, yes, all your mail's up there in the cloud, but whoever gets access to the device can have access to your logon credentials. Plus, in order to give fast response, pretty much every cloud app caches a lot of data on the device. So Google Mail will have your last 50 or last 100 emails. Same is true for just about anything. You, um, you know, you're solving all of this with Avast Virtual Mobile Platform Enterprises. How, how does your solution work better than, say, you know, an, an old-fashioned mobile device management solution? 
Well, the, uh, well, the mobile device management solutions uh, don't take care of uh, removing all of the data from the device. That is, they're not executing your mobile apps on a server uh, somewhere. They're just allowing remote management of all of that and then access to the stuff in the cloud mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, and then we, um, 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 we, uh, remote deleting of things. Yeah. But it's, it's not moving the data off of the device. It's not moving the apps off of the device. And it's not moving the telephony off of the device. With our solution, everything, including phone calls, is off device. And why would why do businesses that choose cloud services, why do they even need to worry about corporate, you know, corporate data that's stored on the end devices? Why do, they, why do they even need to be worried about that? Well, I think it's two things. I mean, corporate data, um, most of us here probably have pretty sensitive data uh, on our phones. I know I've got a lot of sensitive data on my phones. My phones are actually personal phones that I use for, uh, for business usage. And by the way, I do not use WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, it's filled with uh, personal data. Uh, if you want to steal it, my colleague here is, is holding the phone so that um, uh, they're not, they, uh, they don't interfere with the microphone. But there's a tremendous amount of data on those phones. Um, and it's, um, it's what goes with all of us. I mean, most of us um, are hardly using a PC these days. Right. Uh, my wife, uh, she writes this big blog, um, you know, uh, probably four or five times a week, she writes this big blog. And she does the whole thing on her phone. Mm -hmm. um, now, she's Singaporean Chinese, so I think it's genetic that she can hit all those little keys. but. Um, you know, she, uh, she replaced her PC with an iPad, then she replaced the iPad with the big iPhone, yeah. and um, never uses anything else. So everything that she has uh, is on that phone. And there's a lot of people like that these days. Yeah, it's true. Have we got any um, questions from the audience? We've got time. We've got one here over to the right, this gentleman. Hi. Uh, what's being done about uh, ransomware and CBT? Ah, ransomware. Yeah. Um, ransomware is still a much bigger threat on PCs uh, than it is on, 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 uh, on mobiles. And some of the ransomware on mobiles is frankly fake. For example, you can get uh, ransomware that, uh, you know, you st install an app, it has access to your photos. You think when you give something access to your photos, it means it can look at your photos. But when you give, give it access to photos, it has complete access. So what the ransomware does, goes through all your photos, encrypts them, deletes all the unencrypted, and then sells you, uh, a, uh, you know, a, a ransom key to get your photos back. Uh, works very well, except if your photos are backed up to the cloud. If your photos are backed up to the cloud, they still exist in the cloud, and you can ignore uh, that darn ransom. Uh, but if you're not backed up to the cloud, you're hosed. And frankly, that is a fundamental flaw of iOS and Android. I mean, they shouldn't be allowing, you know, photo permission to do anything at all. And I, and I think in still, you know, in, until we close some of those basic um, loopholes or vulnerabilities, um, it, well, they're not really vulnerabilities, they're, shall we say, um, you know, uh, in my era, you know, uh, quite often you call it a bug, a design feature. <laughs> so this is like a design feature. Uh, it's built that way. Uh, but it needs to be fixed. And until it's fixed, uh, yeah, we're going to have ever more ransomware. And it can be ransomware for photos. It can be ransomware for emails, for data, for PDF documents, for anything that's on that phone. Hey, Mark, I saw a couple of other hands. Are there hands up here in the back anywhere? I know there was one question, um, Vince, about here, this gentleman right here in the middle. Let me just ask you, Vince, um, why is it when an app asks for permission uh, to access our photos, why, is it, um, why isn't it just that simple? Um, you say that when it asks for permission to access the photos, it also um, has permission to manipulate them, to delete them, to hold them. Why is that included in that request? Because it's certainly not stated in the request. 
Well, it, it's because the operating systems were built as fairly simple operating systems, you know, because they were running on limited processing. You had to keep the schedulers small and tight. Uh, you know, you didn't have the horsepower to run a complex operating system. That's not the system. case anymore, though, is it? Uh, it, it, it depends on the market. Yeah. But eventually, Moore's Law takes over, and you're going to have enough power. Right. And people are going to also expect their, their mobile devices to do more. Like, I think we're seeing on the newest version of Android, where it now has uh, the ability of displaying two windows instead of just yeah. one window. You know, but right now, for the most part, apps can't talk to each other. And that's one of the reasons why there's not much malware on a mobile device, because malware is just an app. And it can't do anything by itself. To do something, it has to get access. So it can get access through permissions to things like photos to, to, you know, to be ransomware. But if it wants to steal anything, it basically has to get data from another app. But Android and iOS are both pretty simple operating systems, and they don't allow apps to exchange data with each other. Mm -hmm. And they don't allow apps to have access to the kernel, um, which are things that complicated operating systems have to do to provide the services that a user needs. So, iOS and Android are fundamentally simple. Because they're simple, there's some things that are real secure. Yeah. And then there's other things that are real insecure, like the uh, lack of granularity and permissions. But you, as a security guy, though, I mean, wouldn't you agree that it is, that the consumer is being deceived, if not being lied to, when that question is posed on the screen? Uh, no, it's... Um, you don't uh, say that that's, that's a deception? No, no, no. God, if I sat here and said, hey, Google and Apple are deceiving users, that's a great headline tomorrow, and I'm going to get yeah. calls to my lawyers. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it is, but it, there is some truth to that, though, isn't there? Uh, no, because, because they're saying that, hey, the, this application wants access to your photos. And it's really more of an error of omission yeah. than an error of commission. Okay. They don't really define what access is. Yes. That access means I can do anything I want. Right, right. Uh, okay. But that's how it is on it's, them. Yeah, I mean, it's a question of language, I guess, too. This gentleman here had a question. I was just wondering about the virtualization platform coming back to... Uh -huh. um, so it looks like uh, it's a virtualization in the sense that it's, it's more like... Um, like a VNC kind of a VDI type of thing. Uh, you, uh, as far as I know, it's not possible on any of these platforms to actually run a virtualized environment. You kind of set up the question for me a little bit because it looks like the devices are getting more powerful, and you know, on the PCs there isn't, it didn't used to be any virtualized environment uh, until maybe 10 years ago, right? But um, I was just wondering if the virtualization is really what you expect to happen in five years or ten years on mobile, will it be the same way where you actually access some um, corporate applications in the cloud from your phone and the phone is more like a thin client? Or will there actually be stronger isolation, more fine control on permissions and what you can do inside uh, between uh, isolated apps uh, and actually have the equivalent of uh, VMware on the phone? Yeah, I, um, I think the jury's out on which way it's going to go, uh, you know, whether it's kind of all virtualized on a server somewhere or, or, or a containerized approach on the phone with all the permissions, et cetera. Our, our application uh, is actually a complete virtualization on a, um, on a server. So we, so we actually run Android uh, on the corporate servers. And uh, everything you want employees to have access to on their phone, we actually run those Android apps on the corporate server. And then the phone is frankly just an I.O. device. Now, it's a very complicated I.O. device because it has a touch screen, it has accelerometers, it has GPS. So you got to you know, tunnel all of that stuff. So it's very, it's very complicated. And you have to do it so that the, uh, there's really no lag time in the user's use of apps. And we really, we usually demonstrate it by playing Angry Birds. Yeah, you know, because you got to pull back the rubber band, the bird has to fly, it has to hit the pigs, things have to blow up. And uh, Angry Bird plays with no latency. You can't tell that Angry Birds isn't on the phone, that it's on a server 4,000 kilometers away. Um, so those solutions exist. And then, of course, you've got the containerization ones trying to work the permissions. We think that the best long-term 
is to completely move everything that the company cares about from the endpoint, keep it on the corporate servers under control for a large business, and then for smaller businesses, they're probably using the cloud service. Okay. Um, Vince, we've run out of time, but okay. I want to thank you again. A fascinating discussion. Um, and final question, do you see a future where BYOD will be a part of the past? Um, BYOD is a tremendous cost saving for businesses because they have offloaded the cost of the devices to the employees. So unless the German labor unions get involved, <laughs> I don't, don't think, think we're going to see it go away. All right, good. Vince, thank you very much. We thank, appreciate you. It. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.